the show. This is a segment we call Around the National. The National. And, yes. you know, we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of weeks talking about the quote unquote turtle race in the West. Yes. The three teams vying for the final wild card spot the Winnipeg Jets, the Calgary Flames, uh, and the Nashville Predators. And for the Calgary Flames, they've been a team that, you know, despite a tough season, uh, are still in it. And I saw this board over the weekend and immediately DM'd it to EJ Raddick yes. uh, on Twitter. I could have texted him, could have called him, it's interesting but choice. I opted for the DM choice. route. Yeah. But take, take a look at this because in close it's amazing. games, the Calgary Flames have not been good. You look at losses in one goal games, they have 27 losses in one goal games. That's worse than the NHL. Losses in overtime or a shootout, they got 15. That's tied for 31st in the NHL. So second to worst. Losses when getting out shot, um, 29th in the NH, or excuse me, they have 29 of those last in the NHL. Uh, they've also lost a ton of games where they outshoot their opponents. I believe they're somewhere in the bottom of the league for that. And then third, third period comebacks, they seem to have no pushback in the third period <laughs> because they have not had a single third zero. period comeback all season long. No surprise when it's a zero on the board, you're probably going to be last place in the NHL in that category as well. So you look at those numbers guys and I'm just curious what do those numbers tell you about the way that this season has gone for the Calgary Flames and and the way that they've played well you said it there's been very little pushback in games right and they've had some bad fortune they're hitting the post more than other teams so I mean that's you know it's hard to maybe explain why you why you would lead in that category but uh, the bottom line for me is and we talked a little bit about this last couple weeks Jackie is they're not getting to the middle of the ice enough they're not getting good scoring chances from the middle of the ice the scoring chances they're getting are from the outside for the most part and uh, watching them the eye test to me early in the season the eye test was not good we've talked about it here Jack right I said I was out on the Calgary Flames probably in late November or early yep. December just because they just didn't look like the same group and they've never kind of found their way this year yeah well and that board you flashed Jackie I mean yeah that's that's a concern and I'm sure that Derek Earl Sutter and the rest of the organization will be, you know, rehashing the way this season has gone when they've got a chance to look back at it. I'm surprised for a team that played as connected, never mind offensively, as connected as they did defensively last year. This was a really well-structured team. Um, I'm surprised that, you know, those, those numbers look the way they do. But that's not, those numbers aren't the problem. Those are the symptoms of the problem. They're they're, they've been a, they've been abysmal this year. They've been a shadow of what they were last year, and it starts with, you know, swapping into uh, f top six forwards for for guys that had yeah. career years for you last year. That's that's an important part of the explanation. Gaudreau and Kachuk out, Kadri and Huberdeau back in. It takes them a while to find their way. They haven't found it all the way back, not by a long shot. Uh, I don't know if there's a more important explanation. And EJ, I mean, I I, I do. I I, I think. The the, you know the the technical aspects of the game that you're touching on are are important uh, again kind of symptomatic of what's going on but um, goaltending to me is is perhaps the feature reason I mean for Jacob Markstrom who many of us were talking about it was in the Vesna discussion last year we're talking about being the five top five in the NHL it's hard to replicate you know one great year after another but he's 890 this year when he was 920 last year. I mean, 30 basis points and a save percentage is a, is a big deal. He went off the rails in that series against the Edmonton Oilers last year. And Everyone just, did. And he's never, but he really <laughs> did. I mean, but he really did, yeah. right? I mean, it was really concerning the way he played in that series. And he has just never really gotten it back. Yeah. At the start of the season, he, it was a tough start to the season. There have been a, we had uh, some numbers indicating that the first shots in games he was getting beat yeah. more often than well below the average of goaltenders on the first shot of a game. And when you're giving up the goal on the first shot of the game, right, you're now all of a sudden you're fighting an Playing uphill battle the, the whole yeah. night. So the goal, bad goaltending or inconsistent goaltending always undermines all the other things you try to do. So that hurts everything else. But again, I go back to the eye test for me. Watching that team last year, they were suffocating in the way they played. They gave you no time and space on the ice. They got to the middle of the ice. They were causing trouble in front of your in front of the opposing goaltender all the time. And when they had the lead, boy, they just strangled the life out of the game and they beat you. This year, 
They were not anywhere near as fast. They were not anywhere near as in your face on a night-to-night -night basis. And then you add that together with the fact that they were often find themselves behind in games mm -hmm. because the goaltending was not adequate. You put it all together, and this is what you have, a ninth-place team in the Western Conference. Yeah, and they're also 30th in the NHL um, after tra when they trail first in a game. So, yeah. again, that pushback. But I do, you know, listen, the goaltending has not been great for the Calgary Flames. There's no, there's no you know, justifying yeah. Yeah. that. But I do think offensively they have not been the same team either. Yeah. And it's hard when you lose a couple of 40-goal scores from your lineup. And, Eiji, you alluded to those numbers about getting into the inside. We talked about this while I was pumping the tires of one Matthew Kachuk yeah. in Florida. Florida, so the, the fact of the matter is they went from a team that was somewhere top five, top ten in the league at creating scoring chances and shots from the slot, from the inner slot, yeah. high danger chances. They've gone from a top ten team in the league to a bottom ten team in the league. And when that happens, you're going to have trouble winning games. It's only magnified by the fact that you're playing from behind or you, you're you not getting the goaltending that you're, you, you're accustomed to getting. Um, so I think it, it's a lot of things that have yeah. declined for the Calgary yep. Flames, and, and it's been a culmination in them being and the point that they're at. It's actually kind of amazing that they're only four points out of a wild card spot, all things considered. When you look at all of these things, though, the numbers, the speculation that maybe Kadri and Daryl Sutter don't, there's tension in that relationship. Reports that Sutter, to his credit, has denied. Um, what does the future look like for Daryl Sutter here? Do you think potentially he is on the hot seat here? Yeah, I definitely think he's on the hot seat. And you know I love Daryl Sutter. And I, I mean, yes. this guy's won a couple of Stanley Cups. He's been a really good coach for a long time. Um, I got a lot of time for Daryl Sutter, but this is a win in business, as they say, right? And uh, this team has not won this year. Yeah. And there's been like a, a little bit of a bubbling undercurrent to things about the relationships with some of the newer flames and you know he had that little kind of dust up of sorts with the young kid who was playing and he, yeah. he talked to uh, Jacob Peltier talked about like the numbers when asked a question about his performance and that kind of almost belittling. He read the score sheet. Yeah, a little bit. So, you know, I, I think they're going to have to take stock of a lot of things in the offseason and I think coaches do have a shelf life in different places and you know yeah. I, I think he's to answer your question I absolutely think he's on the hot seat and I won't be surprised if they make a change well you know at the coaching position we tend to be a knee-jerk sport from yeah. from the get-go so you know your your fingers on the trigger when things start to go south and go south in the way that they have for the Calgary Flames but Daryl himself has proven over the course of his career and I think you're making this point yeah. um, EJ you know I, I don't know that Daryl can can really can can be behind a bench for, you know, six or seven or eight years, he has a run. Two, two Stanley Cups to their credit, and in the, sh you know, soon, soon after, you know, Daryl's Daryl's being locked out of the room for, <laughs> for some strange reason. Yeah. The guys want to kind of police it themselves. And, and they've kind of heard the message before. Um, I played for Daryl for three years as a member of the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, I do think he's evolved with the game. I don't think he's evolved to the point where, you know, so, some of the um, for some of the coaches behind some of the top tier teams in our game today um, work with young talent and high end talent in the NHL. I think there's a distinction there. Um, all that to say, it, you know, it was a, a hand and glove fit last year, but he had some. You know, he had a handful of career years to go to bank yeah. on, and it made a difference in the confidence without question to the entire group. Yeah. All right, well, a tough task tonight for the Calgary yeah. Flames because they're four points out of a wild-card spot. They're taking on the L.A. Kings, uh, who are absolutely rolling. It's a 12-game yeah. yeah. point streak, 10-0-2 over that span, looking to make it 13. I got three names for you. All right. Kempe. Kofi and Byfield take a look at their numbers over the course of this 12 game point streak. Uh Kempe, eight goals. Kopitar, 13 points. The line as a whole is outscoring the competition 12 to 2 at 5 on 5 over the last 12 games. So this line is clicking right now. Kempe, I think, has 36 goals on the season at this point, if I'm not mistaken. They have been a big part of this hot streak for the LA Kings. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, I think we mentioned Adrian Kempe maybe last week, but again, we don't talk about him near enough. I mean, he is. He, he kind of broke out, I think, last year. He had a really good year. This year, he's kind of he's sneaking up on 40 goals. 
They've really done a nice job with developing Adrian Kempe over the years. They stayed with him, and uh, boy, he's a guy that can score from distance. He has great speed. And you can see here, most goals by a line five on five. Interestingly left, the Coyotes line led by Clayton Keller is, is putting up some uh, significant numbers. But uh, Kopitar, Kempe, and Byfield. And it's, I think, a smart move. We had Luke Robitaille on a couple of weeks ago. He talked about moving Byfield into that line with Kopitar and Kempe. And, like, Byfield is going to benefit mm -hmm. from playing on the wing right now. Big-bodied guy. Every time you come back to the bench, you're sitting next to Andre Kopitar. I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's like going to a Harvard Business School or something right there. So, really <laughs> terrific for for uh, Byfield to have that opportunity right you know, and, and too you know the, you see the success that a group like that is having to me it's it's an important byproduct of everybody and this is generally through free agency over the last couple of years for LA everybody they've gone out and acquired they have hit on it's been yeah. a really yeah. remarkable bounce and I think that permeates resonates through the rest of the roster and the guys I'm talking about Dano uh, you know uh, uh, really notorious yeah. as a shutdown defender but this is a guy that's on I think the precipice of having a better part of a 50 point season this yeah. year 40 plus point season uh, Arvidsson has been fabulous Fiala was a yep. great cap grab out of out of mini, uh, mini Gavrigoff has been Gavrigoff a great fit well. so far from Columbus you and, know and, and Really, follow. if you go right, I was going to make that point. As you go back to the deadline, the one kind of question mark around the Kings, this could be a top tier team. This could be a team to come out of the West. What about Golting? It appears they may have solved that. Corpusalo is undefeated in regulation. He's 4 0 1 since being acquired at the deadline. So um, I'm with you, Jack. Don't sleep on the LA Kings. They are a red hot team out West. Yeah, 929 save percentage for Corpusalo yeah, yeah. uh, in those five starts. Yeah. They, did the their homework. They, the they did deadline. their homework. And like, you know, to Copley's credit, you know, Copley doesn't have a 929 save. He just wins. But he gets wins. He like, they wins. play so well in front of him. And I think it's a testament again to how good the Kings are as a team. Yeah, they really, they defend well. As I talked about all year long, they're, they're a matchup nightmare because of, as Stu pointed out, having to know in there as a two behind. You know, Kopitar, who is still one of the really high-end number one centers in this league, takes some of the pressure defensively off Kopitar, takes some of the face-off pressure off Kopitar, takes some of the penalty-killing pressure off Kopitar. So all of a sudden, this team was a lot different once they made that acquisition. And the moves they've made around him have been really good, too. And the younger players like the Mikey Andersons have come in and yeah. developed. Byfield's being a, a factor now. Kempe has developed into a star player there. I mean... This is a really good team that is going to give, no matter who they play in the playoffs, again, it's a matchup nightmare because they're slotted so well. If they can just keep the puck out of their net, they're going to be really dangerous. I think when you, got, you guys were on the air and we had this conversation with Luke going back a couple of years and, and the whole approach to going out and getting the guys that I mentioned, like Arvidsson yeah. uh, back then, was stabilize things to some degree while these young players are kind of growing into – it growing into their NHL chops. And, and you know, that's been the blueprint. Yep. They've hit on those guys. They've done their homework. And it, it really looks good on Rob Blake, Luke Robitaille, yep. and the rest of the operations yep. crew. It's pretty crazy that that Kopitar line has the second most goals at 5-on-5 five five since All-Star Weekend. Second only to the Keller line. What I would say is that the two goals against, just two goals against yeah. for that line at 5-on-5 five five, um, over that span. I'd be curious to see how many goals against for the Keller line. Just to compare, yeah. right, when you You've got the yep. Kopitar on the line that really is responsible defensively. Yep. I'd just be curious to see, not to take anything away from the no. Coyotes line, but just to kind of further prove the yeah. point of what the LA Kings are able to do yeah. and how good that line has been. Because, I mean, two goals against at 5-on-5 five five over the course of the streak, excuse me, yeah. uh, 12 games is, is pretty wild. Yeah, the Kings haven't had a regulation loss going back to late February when it was here at Madison Square Garden against a pretty good Rangers team. So it's been a while.